So good evening. Um, my name is Charles Stang. Uh, I have the pleasure of serving as the director here at the center. Um, thank you all for coming out this evening on what is turning out to be a not entirely pleasant evening. Um, first of all, uh, let me thank the center staff for making this event possible, as everything that happens in this building possible. Um, I'd also like to thank the um, center's animism reading group uh, now in its second year, led by one of our residents and MDiv students, Mary Balkin. Mary, could you just uh, announce yourself? This is Mary. Mary is amazing. Uh, Mary's, Mary's passions and interests have been an inspiration for this series um, over these past three years, really, right? This is your third year. Yeah. So, and I owe to Mary, um, I, I did not know of, of Graham's work prior to Mary. So um, Mary has been an educator of mine these past several years. Um, and so before we begin, uh, can I please ask you to silence your cell phones, um, or better, just turn them off. So I have the distinct honor and pleasure of welcoming Professor Graham Harvey from the Open University in the United Kingdom, whose lecture falls into one of the center's ongoing series entitled Matter and Spirit, Ecology and the Non-Human Turn. So if you would allow me to, a brief word about the series, uh, then I will give Graham a proper introduction. Recent work in the humanities and the social sciences has generated new interest in the age-old religious question of the relationship between matter and spirit. Okay, let me revisit that request. Thank you. Okay. Phones off? Very good. I mean, you know what, now, that, now I need to do that to myself, make sure I don't embarrass myself. All right, mine's silence too. Yeah, payback, karmic payback would be very quick. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna start that over. Recent work in the humanities and the social sciences has generated new interest in the age-old religious question of the relationship between matter and spirit and its relevance for the environmental crisis we now face. On the one hand, so-called vibrant materialists, such as the political theorist Jane Bennett, ask us to revise our view of matter as an inert object we manipulate, and invite us to think instead of the vibrancy of non-human and allegedly inanimate things. That is, whether they have agency and creativity. This promises to cultivate a different ecological sensibility and different sorts of political interventions in the environmental crisis. On the other hand, for example, anthropologists have revived interests, interest in spirits and their interactions with humans, taking these phenomena seriously, if not always literally, taking them seriously as occasions to widen our notion of agency. Perhaps humans are just one expression of a more widely distributed agency spread across the full spectrum of the alleged antinomy of matter and spirit. Richard Grusin of the Center for 21st Century Studies calls this decentering of the human the non-human turn, or what uh, David Abram might call the turn or the return to the more than human world. Could it be that by shifting our focus away from the human to the more than human world, we might actually summon an ecological imagination that better safeguards humans precisely by displacing them from the center of all inquiry and attention? So we hazard to guess that questions such as these might help us reinvigorate our thinking about religion and ecology. What can these fields of inquiry teach religious studies about cultivating an ecological imagination? and a potent activism, and what can religious studies in turn contribute to these fields. I was thrilled when Graham accepted our invitation to participate in this series. He is professor of religious studies at the Open University, as I said. Over the course of his career he has migrated quite remarkably from research on the religions of the ancient Mediterranean, especially ancient Judaism in all its diversity, to research on contemporary paganism, to redefining the role of religion in and as everyday life, and most relevant for today, revitalizing the contested category of animism, which as we all know has done such harm for um, uh, many traditions around the world. But he's revived it under the banner of the new animism. 
These last three uh, interests of his are all very closely related, of course, and involve drawing on and drawing in contemporary indigenous traditions, especially how traditional human communities engage with the larger than human world. His work is represented by an impressive list of publications, including Contemporary Paganism in its second edition, Food, Sex, and Strangers, Understanding Religion as Everyday Life in 2013, and then most relevant for this evening's topic, uh, Animism, Respecting the Living World, again, also in its second edition, and the monumental edited collection, The Handbook of Contemporary Animism. Graham's lecture this evening will touch upon many of these themes, particularly through blurring the lines of relationality between the human and the more than human. He starts with Bruno Latour's assertion that we have never been modern, suggesting that we have never ceased to be animists. We talk with cats, cars, and computers. We have continued to have relations with and within the more than human world but our relations are clearly damaged by ongoing efforts to separate humans and human culture from quote unquote nature and humans from other species. Engaging with indigenous knowledges, Professor Harvey Graham, forgive me, I'm being casual, Graham, seeks to replace quote unquote nature with more respectful relationships with the world. It is a great pleasure to have you here at the center. Graham, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much for that introduction. I think all the, all the important things have been said, so we can <laughs> get back to the food. Um, no, it's a, it's a great honour to be invited. Thank you, Charles, Mary, Mary, and uh, Ariella Ruth, um, for all the preparation and the, the work involved. Um, <coughs> had a very, very wonderful meeting with the student group uh, yesterday, so um, lots of interesting conversations. Uh, it's a great privilege to have so many interesting people here now, so I'm looking forward to a conversation with you all. Um, I also want to pay respect, I am paying respect, to uh, the indigenous uh, people of this land, and indeed to this land itself, herself, himself, their selves, uh, as they speak to us, um, and the community of multiple living beings around us here. Um, so, so it is a great honor, and it's also a, a, something of a challenge because I'm well aware that I'm using a word, animism, uh, that is hotly contested, uh, even abhorrent to many people. Um, it continues to be used badly, uh, coloniously. Um, if you were to open the Oxford English Dictionary, to work out, to find out what the word might mean, allegedly, you will find a definition that, that basically tells you that a bunch of idiots can't tell the difference between inanimate objects and living beings. It's not a useful definition. <laughs> Definitions should not tell you that, other, that the people who use this word are wrong. So if you're going to use the word inanimate, you can't really engage very heavily with animism. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so, um, so it is a great honour to be here, and, I'm, and also knowing that you've had other very interesting, influential, important people um, uh, in this series. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I revitalised this field. Um, I think that I may have been the first person to use the phrase new animism. It's been alleged by others that I did so. Um, so I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Um, and um, so my, as Charles has already said, um, I, I have published a number of things, myself and with others, and always engaging with others, both other scholars uh, and with other um, informants, hosts, um, generous people who share their knowledge, wisdom with me uh, and with others. Um, so th these are two examples, uh, my animism respecting the living world and the badly named handbook of contemporary animism, at least two hands to hold the thing, it's a rather large book, but it has some great writing in 
by, by many wonderful people. So just in case there's anybody who hasn't um, yet grasped the kind of thing that the new animism is about, um, Irving Hallowell is cited by almost all of us engaged in this field. Irving Hallowell um, spent significant time with the uh, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Ojibwa, Chippewa, by various names, in southern central Canada, on the Barrens River in Manitoba. Um, published an article, a number of articles, but most well known for an article in 1960 um, about Ojibwe ontology. So way before the ontological turn, um, Irving Hallowell was out there um, writing about ontology and challenging fellow anthropologists to take seriously um, and deal respectfully with um, indigenous ways of being and relating. Um, so in a significant moment in Hallowell's 1960 article, Hallowell asks an elder, unnamed in that article, but revealed elsewhere as um, uh, Kiewicz, um, he asked this man, are all the rocks we see around, around us here alive? Uh, and the old man says, with a wonderful answer, no, but some are. Um, and then they begin to unpack what that might mean um, with some humor, uh, with some trickiness. Um, so, so the basic point, and I'm not going to labor this because I've said it too many times and we want to move on to the topic. Um, the basic point is that in uh, Anishinaabe, Moen, grammar, uh, and that of many Algonquin people, speaking <coughs> peoples, um, rocks are marked as grammatically animate. So it's a very good question. Grammatically, rocks are animate. What about these ones? How do you know? What do you do? What, is it, what, what difference does it make that you speak about and perhaps to with rocks um, in this animate grammar? Um, so that, that's, this is a discussion that's cited by many, many people and has provoked us to think about, to rethink what animism might be if it is not what Edward Tyler, the first professor of anthropology at Oxford University, claimed, which is the mistaken belief um, in spirits or metaphysical realities, the, the uh, a mistaken science, um, um, a, a mistaken attempt to understand the cosmos that, that imputed human likeness and spiritual entities in natural phenomena, um, which were, to Edward Tyler, uh, mostly inanimate. Um, so then I, I put this phrase, um, which is just one of many ways of trying to mechanism, how it might be summed up in a rather long car bumper sticker. Um, <laughs> thoroughgoing relation, relationality, continuously negotiated through locally specific cultural etiquette in the larger than human world. Um, so there's a, a lot in that, um, that that's of great importance. Um, and, and in some, some ways, I won't move far away from it today or in anything else I do to do with animism and animists. Um, so I want to acknowledge some of the many people among whom I've learnt uh, about animism who've influenced both my scholarly career uh, and my personal practice, my life, um, as somebody who's come to appreciate the various ways in which um, it is possible to engage with the larger than human world. So they, they include um, Anishinaabe children on a, a reservation in Wisconsin, um, Aboriginal culture teacher uh, in Alice Springs, um, uh, Yoruba diviner and the Orishas um, with whom he engaged, engages. Um, okay, so this is a performance group in Cuba, but um, clearly inspired by um, the practice and life as Santeria devotees. Um, um, a Mayan theatre group, uh, Maori in diaspora in London, um, um, and ju just, to, just to really make it clear from the very beginning that, that these are not people in boxes that might be labelled as 
traditional in that sense of backward looking, fixed in the past, um, in, a, in a allegedly pure uh, ancient tradition that hasn't evolved. Um, all of these, these people are mobile, uh, thoroughly involved in what, the contemporary world, um, and include uh, Christians in the, the Twin Cities, um, in a community that's partly Lakota, partly Ojibwe, um, and maintain parts of both, quote, traditional life, animistic, uh, respectful practice, and um, a recognizable Catholic Christian practice. So all, all of these people and others um, um, demonstrate some of the things that I think can be called animism with some considerable care. Um, so as Charles has said, my, oh yes, hang on, sorry, have I just, have I skipped, oh no, sorry. Right, so having said, I want to learn from indigenous people, I also wanted to note that, okay, as the title says, we have always been animists. So we have, we've all learnt how to be animists because we are all in relationship all the time, whether you like it or not, with other species. So to some degree, there, there may be a difference between people who clearly identify with the effort to engage respectfully with the larger than human community or particular members of it beyond the human community and the rest of us who, like it or not, are necessarily engaged all the time. Um, so there's a sense in which animism is every day, is entirely part of just being a living being uh, within the planet. So we're encouraged to take um, probiotic um, substances into our guts to include to improve the community of bacteria that live within us. Okay, just a few of the many millions of, of other than human beings who are uh, at home within what we think of as our bodies. Um, they are, if not the majority of your cells within this skin bag of your body, they are at least pro producing the majority of the DNA if you were to be put into a liquidizer and separated out into bits of DNA, the bacteria would be the majority of that DNA. Okay, many of us have great affections for, for trees, for plants of other kinds. We, we have these relationships and my wife is looking at me because I put up a picture of our, the cat with whom we live. The cat <laughs> who privileges us by allowing us to live um, some sometimes share the chair and so on. So, and many of you live with other, other than human beings, um, deliberately so. And you, and you not only name them, you have conversations of various kinds with them. Um, you learn the appropriate etiquette, especially with cats. I mean, dogs will fit in with whatever you think you want to do, but cats will educate you about how to behave appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> So, so we learn what it is to live with multi, in a multi-species world um, in all sorts of ways. Okay, so um, my title is obviously a play uh, on Bruno Latour's um, great bit of writing. Sometimes Bruno Latour writes not quite so well as this, but I think this is a nice piece of writing in which he provocatively says, we have never been modern, um, but we've tried very, very hard, and we keep trying very, very hard. Um, and um, so there are lots of examples in Latour's work about what he means by this sort of modern with a capital M, a, a project of becoming moderns. Um, so although we've never been modern, we've, we've tried. And Latour in a number of, a number of times has said, well, I want to try and think about what we've been if we've not been modern. And I don't think he's really been entirely convincing about what he thinks we've been if we've not been modern. 
because his major role in his career is to challenge the moderns among us, which is often scholar, scholars, because we, scholars, keep dividing the world as moderns between, let's face it, the natural sciences and the social sciences. So we are deeply implicated in dividing the world into humans and everything else. And we treat the everything else, nature, whatever you want to call it, the natural world, very differently to the way we, we treat humans. So we use words like society to, to speak about humans. Um, maybe poetically we might stretch those boundaries, but we haven't really escaped entirely. So, um, so Latour uses a number of examples in which um, the boundaries between what, you, what, what one might think of as nature and, that, and what, you, what one might think of as human culture or human products or human life are now impossible to distinguish. So the ozone layer, the ozone hole rather, is a natural result of human activity. It's a, 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 a response by the larger than human world to humans, human activity in spraying uh, aerosols and so on. So, okay, so that was the hole some years ago. The hole is closing. Um, but there are lots of other examples in which um, you can't really insist that, that the ozone hole... Do you want to sit down there? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. Um, um, that these things can be separated in any really useful way. Um, but we've kept trying. So, so Latour, one of one of his one of his illustrations is around this um, dichotomy between non-humans, nature, and humans, culture, and and the continuous effort to purify that that boundary to keep uh, nature different. We can be we can enjoy nature, we can be romantic about it, but 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 it's not culture. And to, to say to mistake it as culture is what allegedly primitive people animists do to think of of nature as a, as a realm with society and so on and so on so um, I'm going to come back to that um, so instead uh, in the, the work of translation that, that Latour talks about in this in that um, we've never been modern he um, he talks about hybridity so we keep using these words like hybrid. Uh, in, in the study of religions, we use words like syncretism. And in the biological sciences, we worry uh, perhaps about um, symbiosis um, as rather strange kind of things. Um, although, in fact, they are the norm. Um, and what needs explaining is not syncretism and symbiosis. They're, they are the norm. What, what we what we need to explain is when sometimes stuff gets separated into boxes where this is what it is to be a Christian, not to be confused with a Buddhist or an animist or something else, whereas in reality people continuously learn and share from other, other, other beings, other persons, other, other cultures. So, so modernity... is, um, let me say, i use your phrase, which I'm not sure whether I actually said it before, modernity um, is a purity religion, uh, purity system. So like, so with many of us are familiar with Judaism uh, and Kashrut as being a, a purity system, keeping things separate, keeping milk and uh, meat separate. But modernity is an even more elaborate, if you can imagine that, um, purity system, purity of religion. So, um, so Latour, in his other his more recent publications, has, has thrown at us lots of other ways of trying to think about not hybridity, that's something rather weird, but and not society, not trying to 
um, extend society outwards, um, but to talk about assemblages, sort of gatherings of different kinds of being, different kinds of person, different kinds of um, uh, existences, some of which may be objects. So I, I can't live not only without the bacteria, sorry, I've talked about the gut bacteria, but my favorite bacteria are the ones who prefer to live in our elbow crooks. Right, sorry, so that's why I, I wasn't going to tell you that, but there are, <laughs> but I just went like that, so I thought I'd better explain it. There are six tribes of bacteria whose preferred real estate is your elbow crook. Right, so if you want to engage with nature, never mind going off into the woods, just, right. Okay, sorry, sorry, that was, right. Um, so, so there's these assemblages, but yeah, I'm, so as well as the bacteria, Clearly, I can't do this kind of stuff without a lectern, without a glass of water, without chairs, and, and without you coming together, and so on. So there's, there's different kinds of assemblage, and we are not divorced from all the other um, assemblages of beings with whom we relate, communities, kin, which include cats, computers, cars, trees, and so on. Um, I did also mean to say slightly earlier that um, um, one of the ways in which um, we, all of us, especially you in this room, um, more so than me, because I'm going back to England and we, anyway, one of the ways in which you engage with the large in human world is you celebrate Thanksgiving. So you are having an, an, soon an annual festival in which you are giving thanks two, four, you know, it can be done differently, and you're engaging with turkeys and other, other beings. <laughs> so, you know, there are interesting things there. Let's, for now, leave aside colonial settlement and so on. But, so Thanksgiving is another one of those ways in which you might think about how you, we, have always been animists. But I'm going to move on. So this is, so this is the kind of... Um, the simple point of, of my rambling tonight, which is that, that the word nature, the idea that there is a realm called nature, appropriately called nature, is one of the big things that keeps dragging us back into being moderns, in Latour sense with a capital M. Um, keeps dragging us back into that purity system. It keeps, we keep, it keeps, the way we imagine, the way we speak about nature, the way we engage with what we think of as nature, um, puts us back into that separatist, human separatist movement that is modernity, that, um, that makes us think that we're different. Um, so when we see a nature program, even really good ones like David Attenborough's programs, most of the time what you get there isn't the really current science Sometimes it is, but not always the really current science of multi-species relationship. Often it's, here's a bunch of animals who are either making noises to, to attract mates or they're um, craftily hunting other animals. So there's basically animals do two things. They either, it's either about food or about sex. And you go, okay, so that, it, we, we don't, reduce all of human culture to those things, we might, um, but we do, that's what nature is. Na animals are instinctive um, and, and so on. So even, even some of the most recent bits of David Attenborough fall back into that narrative of um, animals do these couple of things. So you get endless footage of, um, of animals hunting each other um, or attracting mates and so on. Um, a classic version of what nature has been throughout modernity. Um, okay, so I was going to talk about what, what nature might be. Um, so, um, so in, in one sense, in the modern sense, nature is a realm beyond the human. It's a place that we go out to um, that is... As far as we can, we, we want to find a place which is 
wilderness wild, a place that is less affected by humanity. Um, and those places are increasingly hard to find, uh, either because there are very few places where at night there is no light pollution or um, other kinds of pollution. There is actually almost nowhere on this planet now where you, if you had a Geiger counter, could not discover the effects of Hiroshima and Chernobyl and Six Mile Island and so on. The, the radiation level, background levels on planet Earth are higher than they were before humans did things with uranium and other substances, which are you know, nature, part of the, the soil, the, the rock, but now they're, they're out there. So we've changed the planet um, in very significant ways. So, so th this is a kind of part of my struggle to find an illustration for, for nature. Um, but it, but I, re I refused to find... I was going to put up a picture of a, of a, a wilderness preserve. But most of North America, as you know, um, those, those wilderness places are places where humans were evicted in order to, in, to increase the, the possibility for non-human nature to be preserved. In Britain, people have this romantic notion that we can go to places like the Lake District and find all the Scottish Highlands and, and find the wild. Uh, in fact, what you visit when you go to those places is a landscape degraded over the last 10,000 years by human interaction, a place of very limited biodiversity. Um, so, uh, so this picture is of, um, uh, of Australia, and I, I was inspired to find this picture by Debbie Bird Rose's work with Aboriginal Australians, where an Aboriginal culture teacher told her when looking for the wild that the wild is not a place where humans do not engage, but a place where humans um, engage badly. So the exploitation of the land for cattle ranching and so on has so degraded the land that most of this what was a productive ground is now almost inert and the soil erosion is becoming worse and worse. So the, the wild um, is not a positive term for this, this particular community. So I'm trying to find nature, but what I want to do, obviously, because of what I've said so far, is to, is to reach beyond. And I'm seeking for other, other ways of thinking about what is the world if it isn't uh, a realm separated between humans and nature or culture and nature. So, so these are, are some examples. Sorry, I've obviously gone to the bacteria there, the elbow bacteria, nicely coloured in. So, so they're, they're doing interesting things, living interesting lives. Um, this is the page from Darwin's notebook when he first started thinking about his kinship between humans and all other beings. So I think there is a relationship, an evolutionary relationship between humans and other beings. So, so I'm looking here for models of kinship. Um, so on the other side, uh, one of Latour's more recent uh, writings um, in which he tries to think about getting away from culture nature, um, staying in this world rather than the seven worlds that we're exploiting in order to live um, um, the way we do live, consuming so much. Um, and he's using words like terror, as in terran, um, earthy, belonging. So there are a whole host of words um, about emplacement. Uh, for Aboriginal Australians, rather than talking about nature, people talk about country. Country meaning a place where a community, a multi-species community, belongs and has mutual rights and responsibilities for the well-being of the, the full range of, of um, beings who live in that, that country, um, including especially those who you want to eat and, and those you don't want to be eaten by. So, so we're all familiar with the picture of Earth 
from Apollo. Um, so the, the kind of question then is sort of where do we find ourselves in that image? Uh, and there's been lots of debate about that image and how it's used. And for some people, it's a very inspiring image of the small blue-green planet that, if not unique, um, is at least rare and um, remote from any other planet that we know that there is still life on. So, you know, we need to we need to protect, we need to be respectful, and so on and so on. So it's a great image for some of us who want to uh, engage respectfully. But it has also been alleged that that it's a terrible image because it implies that we humans can step outside, view the whole package, uh, and manage it in some way, whether for human benefit or for ecological good. There's a sort of managerial start style. Or if you're of that ilk, you might think of it as um, stewardship. But this is a kind of divine view, if your divinity is the kind of being who lives outside the planet. Um, so so it's, a, it's a complex image. Um, so the struggle then to find images that inspire us to place ourselves back in the land, back in the, the country, back in place, back in whatever the world is, if it is not nature culture. Um, so I could at this point um, summarize some of the people that I think you've had in this room and have read in your reading group, um, the next couple, this and the next slide, certainly several slides, um, several people involved. Um, so, um, so I'm thinking of work by Isabel Stengers um, on cosmopolitics, and Latour's picked that up. Uh, Viveros de Castro writing about Amazonian multi, multinaturalism rather than multiculturalism. So there is a single culture that all beings um, perform uh, as they relate with others. But there are multiple natures given to us by the particular kind of eyes and bodies that we have that makes us see the world differently. So jaguars, humans, peccaries and others all see themselves as beings who live in homes, eat cooked food and, so, and have kin. Um, but we all see, we see each other differently as prey or predator for one. You know, that's one example. So, um, so Viveros de Castro came up with this term multinaturalism as a challenge to the Western modern conception that there is a single nature and a multiple multiple cultures which we struggle to understand and study in the, the human or social sciences. Um, so Latour picked that up and again Latour is very good at picking up interesting phrases. So and he, he then he then uses uh, mononaturalism to, to talk about nature and so on. Um, Donna Haraway staying with trouble. Um, um, Alvin Early talking about geoontologies and the um, the contrast, which is also implicated in this nature culture thing between bios, bio, biology, and geos, geology, allegedly inanimate bedrock, um, which is just a substance that, okay, minerals get taken up into bodies and evolve somehow into bios, into biology, but, but is somehow separate. So there's a whole lot of stuff around um, um, how does that geos, how do those basic minerals and the subatomic particles gain consciousness? How do, how do we, how at some point does consciousness arise from what is allegedly inanimate um, geos, um, inanimate material, matter? So new materialists challenging all those kind of notions. So there's a whole rich field here. Um, so whether it's under the label of ontology or the new materialism um, and, and a host of other phrases, they all relate in various ways to, um, to animistic, uh, new animistic notions. Uh, other people, um, um, Marilyn Strathern, many years ago, um, built on, on the, the term dividuals. So, so if one of the things that modernity 
encourages us to do it is to is to individualize into individuate a whole Jungian practice around individuating and so on um, Melanesians encourage individuation so what the encouragement there is to become better relations so um, so this is the point where I quote Monty Python so in that brilliant moment in Monty Python's Life of Brian, some of you are far too young, you, you, some of you will remember that Brian, the not-prophet, comes out on the balcony and tells them all to go away. You don't need a leader. You don't need a prophet. You're all individuals. Come on, somebody's seen the film. I'm not, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I should have said there could be some, some audience participation here. So, so the opposite to that would be, you know, um, um, you're not individuals. You know, we're, we're all individuals, and then somebody can go, well, I'm, I'm not, or I am uh, an individual, and kind of, well, no, hang on. So there's this tension. They're, and again, they're, those are pure forms, individuals and individuals, because actually we are, we moderns, uh, are also encouraged to be good relations, to be respectful as we drive down the road or walk down the pavement. Um, we're expected to behave appropriately. So we are expected to be good relations, to talk politely with our close kin and so on. Um, so, so the pure forms are not to be separated out like we don't do it and they, they don't do individualism because clearly Melanesians do do individualised practice. But So Marilyn Stratham, very, very interesting, very important, feed into this whole debate. Um, the late, great um, Val Plumwood, um, writing about ecofeminism, the wonderful article, Being Prey, in which having been attacked by a crocodile because she was in the wrong place, the wrong time, behaving badly, the crocodile policed her behavior, but also tried to benefit itself because crocodiles like eating humans. So, as she discovered, she survived to write a brilliant article and then go on to write some brilliant books under the label of ecofeminism. So a significant effort to, um, to find different ways to engage with the larger than human world. Um, um, okay, I think I've probably used... Yes, I should move on quickly. So um, I'll just tell you else is on screen. Um, Debbie Bird Rose, talking about the wild, also recently deceased. Um, Karen Barad, um, agential realism, rather kind of interesting provocative phrase to think about um, subatomic particles and other uh, way other conscious material beings um, and the way that the world uh, seems to work. Uh, Anna Singh and, and colleagues writing very recently about the arts of living on a damaged planet, um, finding new ways to engage, to insist that, um, that we need to think differently about um, the multiple species with whom and among whom we live and who live within us. So that brings me to Lynn Margulis, who coined the phrase symbiogenesis. Um, so um, evolution is not um, pushed forward by the competition of one against another, but by the working together of multiple species. So we are only what we are because bacteria and other beings make us who we are. Cats, too, of course. Um, so, so all these, pe these people uh, and many others um, feed into these interesting struggles to think differently about nature culture, about modernity, modernism, animism, and all the other possibilities. But we could go much, much further back in this struggle. So here's a picture um, of Gilgamesh and Enkidu fighting against Huawa, Humbaba, uh, ancient Akkadian and even earlier Sumerian, um, um, not heroes perhaps. So, for those of you not familiar, um, um, Gilgamesh, um, king of Uruk, um, is, a, is, a, is a kind of anti-hero kind of character who becomes a, a hero later on. But at this moment, he decides um, with his best buddy Enkidu um, to go off and 
and chop down the cedar forest, the realm of the deities, and to bring back the hidden, the hidden wisdom, the, the god's wisdom, which was not supposed to be available to humans. Uh, you may recognize bits of this story from elsewhere. Um, so they go and they, they slaughter the, the guardian, um, but Enkid Enkidu tries to persuade the Lumish not to do this. Um, so in this text of, what, 6,000 years ago or longer, we already see, I mean, explicitly in the text, uh, in the conversation between Gilgamesh and Enkidu, um, um, a challenge between the kind of objectifying um, extractivism. Let's take back this wood and build um, doors for the temples and palaces and beds um, and so on um, against respectful restraint that, that others and the text kind of implies we might think differently um, about. So, you know, so this, the sources that I want to think with and through are ancient as well as contemporary. They include people that you've, um, um, that I've, I mentioned before, so these kids from the reservation learning about Ojibwe grammar, um, Larry Gross writing about being silent in the forest, the realm, of the the others, um, so when when Anishinaabe kids are taken off into the forest to do their first maple syrup um, sugar bush gathering, um, they're told to be quiet because this is their realm, the realm of the larger than human community. And we're just visiting. We need to be respectful, and the kids go on making a lot of noise. But next year, they learn and they they adapt and they they get the etiquette in the end. So learning silence as well as learning to speak with a part of standard um, education, educative systems among indigenous people. And Winona LaDuke wrote this wonderful book, um, All Our Relations, picking up that Lakota phrase uh, from Sweat Lodge, Ritual Practice. Um, but I don't think I can really get any better than Linda Hogan um, 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 Chickasaw writer, in her first chapter in my edited handbook of contemporary animism, her chapter is called "We Call It Tradition." So she, among others, said, "Why do we need this word animism? You know, we just call it tradition. It's what we do. Um, we live with a multi-species community. We have ways of respect, respectfully living. Why do you need to make it more difficult with these weird isms and so on?" So we had a great conversation, and I. I recommend if you do go and get this book or whatever, read Linda Hogan first, read the last chapter by Ronald Grimes last. I'll come back to Ronald Grimes a bit later. Um, they're they're the, the front and back of the book. Everything in between is kind of examples of other ways of doing things, but they're, they're fantastic chapters. Um, so I don't think I can really say much better than, okay, L Latour has picked up a lot of second-hand knowledge from indigenous people, um, from Viveros de Castro and others, from Descola and others, and the argument between Viveros de Castro and Descola. Um, and, and he's kind of presented it provocatively to the rest of us. So important writer, but, um, but we can go straight to the sources, published authors like, indigenous authors like Linda Hogan and, and many, many others. Um, Harry Garuba, Nigerian poet, uh, professor of English in Cape Town, um, says, if you don't understand animist realism, you will not understand anything about Africa. So African animist realist novels. So there are plenty of wonderful presentations um, in those people's writing. So we can probably do no better than that in thinking about the cos cosmopolitics that might arise from these efforts to think differently about the way we might live. So, you've also had Robin Wall Kimmerer um, and um, I think Carl yeah. Carl White. Oh, no, um, you must get Carl White, right? So, um, botanist ecologists who whose very scholarly academic work, tenured professors. Um, are engaging respectfully 
powerfully with their own indigenous knowledges. Both of them are Potawatomi scholars. So Carl White, for example, says, um, if you want to know, if you want to find resources for dealing with climate disaster, mass extinction, and so on, then we've already been through it. We were shipped from the forests and lakelands of the Canadian-US Midwestern border, Potawatomi lands, to Oklahoma, an arid zone, where we knew none of the plants, where it didn't rain as much, and so on and so on. We've already been through climate change. Those of us that survived, some of us have gone back, some of us are still in Oklahoma, um, have resources for thinking through. So Carl White, a lot of his practice um, is to go to reservation communities around reserve communities and help people to think through what resources there are in, in their traditional cultures and, and everyday lives to carry on dealing with the continuing accelerating mass extinction um, and climate disaster that we are now implicated in. But there are others. Um, quote, ordinary people. So, so this is a film, this is a picture rather, of a um, mountains and a river uh, in Sapmi, Sami territory in what's uh, Arctic Norway. Um, so this is um, the grounds of a festival called Ridu Ridu, um, held every July in the Sami land uh, near a field. Um, brings together a lot of indigenous performers. Just it's a wonderful event, and I've had the privilege of going there for several years. Um, so one year I was kind of taking a break from the hard work of listening to indigenous rock bands and folk groups and yoikas and so on. Like, you know, how do I do this? And I was just standing by this river and I thought, it's higher than it's been on previous visits. And this local guy said to me spontaneously, um, this is very bad. The, the salmon and the trout are out in the field, not very far away from here. They want to come upstream, but because the, the, the ice is melting off the, the mountains much faster than it should do, more than it should do, the river is higher and colder than it should be, and the fish cannot get into the river. If they don't get in the river, they, will, they won't spawn, they'll, they'll be dead, and the salmon in particular, they will not come back to this river maybe ever, or until a salmon accidentally swims up the wrong stream, because salmon go back to their spawning ground. So this guy was not talking about um, Sami livelihood, um, although he could have done, because these are coastal Sami who do rely on fishing and so on. He was talking about what we have done to a multi-species community and how we desperately need to do something to address this problem. So, you know, the, these are quite ordinary people, not only botanists and scholars of different kinds of science. And we, we know then there are people out marching on the streets in the Extinction Rebellion. Um, there's a, a great sense of urgency. There are people creating um, mourning rituals for the species we've already lost. Um, so, um, so, and this is, this is precisely in the context of um, we've never been modern, but we keep trying, and nature keeps nature keeps bringing us back into it because we keep thinking it's elsewhere. The, the extinctions, you know, the, the the message the media keep giving in Britain, at least, is we must do something about this because otherwise it's going to affect our businesses, our homes our cities will go underwater and so on, as if the, the only important thing about climate change was whether New York and London will be underwater soon and humans will be affected. Um, so, you know, the sixth mass extinction is already massively impacting other species. Um, so, so these kind of efforts are of great significance. Um, but okay, so I'm a scholar of religion. I'm interested in religion, as many of you are. Um, so 
So there are, I, I'm kind of interested, and I'll do this fairly quickly, um, in both definitions and approaches, the scholarly approaches that we, that we have to, to these issues of what religion might be in this world that is not divided between nature and culture. Because, because very often um, we get presented with a notion of religion which is like this. Okay, our Open University marketing department, um, when we were creating a new course, offered this as an image of religion. Um, okay. <laughs> this image, right? Th this image, entertainingly, is called Man and His God. So, okay, so I hang out with pagans and indigenous people, so my immediate naughty response was, well, is he sitting on his god? Or <laughs> is, is, he a, is it a sky god? I mean, I mean I, and I did it without really thinking through it, and then I realized what I meant to think of is this is Rudolf Otto in the numerous experience. <laughs> in the, uh, you know, man in his solitude encounters the majesty of God, is humbled, crushed by that experience, and you go, that's how often we still think of as it's an individual human exercise. So I go back to the Twin Cities Catholic Church, Lakota Ojibwe Catholic Church, in which um, religion isn't just something humans do between themselves and their deity, even Christian deity. Religion is something that engages um, Buffalo, tobacco, water from the Ojibwe tradition, where they carry water bottles. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of I wanted to find, you know, where is religion? What what would religion mean if it was arising explicitly in a multi-species relational world? If animism, if we accepted this kind of uh, new animistic approach, what would we? How would we think about religion? So, um, so one of the ways in which I, in, sorry, and I put the, the cover of my Food, Sex and Trains book in because that's what I try and do in that book is I take, I reverse the, the practice of taking a Protestant Christian early modern definition of religion, belief in God, that's been exported. You know, so the Sri Lankan Buddhists set up the Young Men's Buddhist Association with a nice creedal statement what Buddhists believe, right? So we, we find 10 things that Buddhists believe in the 19th century. So we, we've exported that notion of religion, and I want to turn the tables and say, okay, let's, let's find definitions of religion from elsewhere, come back and look again um, at what we, what we are familiar with, even among the churches and mosques and uh, synagogues and elsewhere. So, um, so another... Um, sadly missed uh, scholar, um, Tepa Kakatafai, um, a Maori scholar, many years ago wrote a, a wonderful article um, called Maori Religion, in which he has this phrase that I've quoted many times, which is, the purpose of religious activity among my people is doing violence with impunity. Right? So the purpose of religious activity among my people is doing violence with impunity. Because almost every, whatever you want to call it, culture, every, uh, almost every human community is told not to kill. Full stop, absolute. Not, don't kill except you're allowed to kill carrots or cows or capitalists. <laughs> I was just looking for a, sorry, that was, that was just me drawing a bit of alliteration. But, um, but you have to, you have to kill because you're also told things like you've got to feed your guests, you've got to shelter your guests. So you've got to go into the forest and chop down a tree. Uh, so this is a totara tree, um, one of the largest trees native to Aotearoa, New Zealand. But this tree is also, and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid some of you were there last night when I told a bit more of this story, and I'm not going to do it all tonight, so you need to go and read around about, about, about Maori cosmology, Maori origin stories, Maori evolution stories. So, so the Totara is also Tane Mahuta, the god of the forest 
Who is the being, the deity? Who separates Mother Earth and Father Sky? So without Tane doing what he does, separating sky from Earth, there would be no space between the loving couple and their children, Tane Mota among others, stuck in that space, creating the space. So when, when this tree is cut down, it's used to make meeting houses, Faranui, uh, like this one, this one. She, she, she is Hinemihi, uh, who now lives in near Guildford, south of London. Um, it's an interesting story in that too. And uh, Maori diaspora community do ritual there. Um, so, so when the tiny motor is cut down, when the Totara is cut down, he is, he is then taken in and made with great respect into a meeting house in which the roof is above the floor. Good arrangement. In which things can happen, negotiations can take place. So, so the, the ritual is the bit you do, the religion is the bit you do when you go into the forest and you approach these beings, these powerful, creative, cosmologically absolutely important persons and you say, sorry, please, um, thanks. And you ritualize it because they don't necessarily speak te reo Maori or English or whatever. So their rituals are the way in which you engage across species boundaries. Um, so that that's a, a brief version of um, Pakatafai's rich phrase, um, um, purpose of relativity is doing violence with impunity. Okay, so, um, but, but you might also think about Thanksgiving rituals, not so much the um, 19th century evolved American or Canadian version of Thanksgiving, so much as the Iroquois Haudenosaunee version of Thanksgiving, in which thanks are expressed um, in, a, in a thoroughly ritualized um, negotiation with the rest of the world. So, so there are rich resources um, for being provoked to think differently about our relationships. Um, so what it comes down to then is about celebrating our relations um, of multi-species beings, not of all, all of whom are nice, so I didn't put, put up the picture of the crocodile, but it's a rather nice picture of a bird singing on a cold morning, but still, you know. Um, there, are, there are these provocations. If we think differently about the world, not as a place where humans do culture and the rest of nature is just about breeding and eating, but a place where beings communicate about all kinds of issues, all kinds of issues. Um, and that the, the encouragement then is to celebrate those in the place where you find yourself and to find the right way to engage with those, those beings. So last, last image, one way in which that happens among the Sami is called yoiking. So a yoik uh, is a particular style of chant that is gifted from the singer to the other. So it could be sung to the field, to the mountain, to another human, to an elder, to the salmon, to all kinds of beings. Um, and when, when the person makes the yoik uh, about the other person, mountain, river, whatever, whoever, um, the yoik not only sums them up, but becomes their property. So it ceases to be my intellectual property if I was the the yoika, it becomes the intellectual property of the forest, the human, the salmon, whatever. Um, so um, so that, that brings me back to that last chapter in the handbook of contemporary animism, which is um, uh, Ron Grimes, ritual studies scholar, um, riffing off a phrase written, uh, written by the poet Gary Snyder, um, which is uh, performance is currency in the deep world's gift economy. So in the deep world, which we have been pleased to call nature culture, 
separated out, but let's find different ways of speaking about it. This world that we live in, with all of its local con uh, countries and places of belonging, um, what, what's, what we do as humans uh, to engage, to catch the attention of other beings, other species, to get involved is some sort of performance, however improvised it might be, however traditional it might be, and so on. So there's that, that flow. And importantly, that's the same thing that the eagles are doing, that the bears are doing, the rocks are doing, the fjords are doing. They're also performing to engage other species. So these are, these are all ways in which um, I want to, to present to you as a way, ways of thinking differently about a world that until now we've thought of as separated between culture and nature. We've, we've been forced back, despite the fact that we've always been animists to one degree or another. We've also been encouraged back into the modernist world. We put all this effort into dividing human science, natural science, and so on and so on. Um, the, the doing rituals in this larger community might have interesting results with some urgency because of the nature of the time we live in. Uh, thank you very much for listening.